Good evening. Welcome to Community and Technology, where we connect the global community with news, information, and resources to hopefully help improve your life. I'm Stu Reed. I'm here with my co-host, Dave Burstein. Hey, Dave. Hello. And, and let uh, me introduce our guest. Yes, please. Scott Walston was the chief economist of the U.S. Broadband Plan. He's the best economist working in this stuff in Washington. I've <laughs> known him for 15, 20 years. We often disagree, but when we disagree, I look very closely because he's willing to work from the evidence and he doesn't get overwhelmed by the politics. And he's seen a lot of things and he just did a very important study that totally tells you what should and shouldn't be done in Biden's infrastructure spending. And we'll get there. But let's start out with the news. Let me give the first one because it's important. Starting next Wednesday, there will be a huge subsidy to Verizon and Comcast and AT&T and a smaller one to people who need to be connected. There's 50 bucks instead of the 15 bucks it should cost, which Scott and I may wind up going. I got, I got the economist here. Uh, and that 50 bucks can go to your connection if you can show you have a kid in school, you're eligible for food stamps and so on. The people doing this want to spend the money. They made a compromise that maybe had to be done, but instead of the 15 or 20 bucks the T-Mobile and Comcast were willing to have the service for the poor, they got $50 out of Congress. I mean, the majority of it is just corporate welfare. But it's coming, it's there. You're gonna be able to get a fairly decent free connection for the next year and maybe the next two or three years. That's a good thing, even if they're wasting more than half the money. Scott, when I, can I catch you later on whether it should be $15 or $50 and how you look at it? Um, absolutely. First, thanks for the very kind introduction. Hopefully you'll have the same opinion of me after this um, that you did going into it. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk about there's there's a there is a lot to talk about in that issue. Yeah. Did you work with Paul Milgram when you were at Stanford? He well, I was um, I was uh, I, I was a student at the time. Um, and so I took classes with him um, and you know, and I, of course, I speak with him, but I've not, I've not worked with him on any, on any if, projects. If he studied with Paul Milgram, he's somebody we should hear on this. Paul Milgram rests on the Nobel Prize for his work on auction theory. He's the world expert on this kind of stuff. So I'm glad we have Scott because I don't understand half of what Milgram is talking about when he's there, but he's really good. Oh, I, I mean, Next I've known him for 20 there. years. I, I still have to understand less than half. <laughs> uh. Yeah, but I, I know enough of it, and I've seen some of the results to know that his, his work is that good. So somebody who studied with him knows more than I do on this subject. Uh, but let me, let's go to the other news. Stu, what happened at Facebook? Well, their uh, advisory board had a meeting and uh, took a look at their decisions of, uh, I guess, three, four months ago to ban uh, the past president, uh, 45. And they decided, thankfully, in my mind, to continue his Facebook ban, at least for another six months, as I understand it. And they will revisit that decision uh, six months down the road. Uh, and, and, and in my mind, uh, this guy, uh, the past president, wreaked so much havoc on the country and on democracy itself that, uh, you know, I think he should have the same lifetime ban on Facebook that, that Twitter gave him. That's my own personal feeling. Uh, he is destructive. Uh, he's a, 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 a serial liar. I mean, that's, that's been documented. I forget how many thousands of lies. Uh, he got documented by the media uh, over his four-year uh, administration. And that someone with that kind of uh, a megaphone uh, as Facebook, I mean, it's, it's a real danger to this country and democracy. So I'm happy to see that they uh, upheld that decision of, of a few months ago. 
Uh, you know, I, I don't know where they're going to go six months from now, but at least for now, we have a little bit of respite. And uh, I must say, just psychically, it's been so much more comfortable not having to hear about him and hear the media report what he said about this, that, or the other. I mean, wow, what a relief. That, that, that's my own personal feeling. I, I see you nodding, Scott. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I know that's not why you have me here, but uh, I totally agree. Yeah, I, yeah. The, <laughs> the less yeah, we hear from him again, more. the better. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, that, and Jim Ciccone agrees with us. <laughs> Do you remember that? Um, I think the, that's right. I think he was uh, for, for Hillary. The guy who, who pretty much elected uh, the first Bush six months before the election said, keep away from this Trump. I know him. And he all but resigned from his lifetime dedicated role in the Republican Party. Uh, and he was right. I learned a lot from the conservative Republicans in DC. But it's not clear to me that shutting him down is the right thing. I think no more of him than Stu does. I don't know if it's right to shut him down because what I'm going to be saying in a few minutes is that Joe Biden and his people are planning to waste $50 billion on unnecessary politically inspired spending on fiber where people already have a perfectly fine cable connection. And I'd much rather that go to housing. And to explain and to push for it, I don't think I'm gonna bother naming them here, but some of the best people in DC and the most progressive uh, several of whom were good friends, are blind as to why they're wrong and why they're wasting federal money as Trump was blind to a lot of his things. So when you try to get rid of somebody because they're saying bloody wrong things, it's a hard call and I'm not sure whether I think. Now, let me give you two more pieces of news one of which is going to come up again. Did I? No, I, it was before we went on the air. We have data on SpaceX and Starlink and how that satellite broadband is working. That got released this morning by uh, speedtest.net. And unfortunately, some of it was pretty dismal. The first people who put data out, and I was getting it on Reddit and Tom Epsilon, actually blogged about it and so on, was saying they were getting 100 over 20, 100 down, 20 up. That's actually an FCC standard. It's a pretty decent service. Uh, I certainly could live with, I'm living with 100 over 10. I downgraded from 200 over 20 because I didn't need it. Uh, but apparently the folks who first got up there with data were the ones who were doing well. And the data we got from speed test is that many of the folks, half of them didn't get those speeds. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about how you reach the last 5% of the population. Uh, so we'll get to that one. Dave, Scott. can I ask you a question about that data? Um, I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, one, of the, one of the questions about, uh, about Starlink was, uh, you know, when there were those first great reports, one question was, well, that's great for those first five people who are on it, but is it going to scale? And is this a problem of scale or is it a, a, a problem inherent to the technology? We don't have enough data yet. Mm, okay. Right? It's officially in beta. They're still scrambling to get the software working right. Three quarters of the satellites haven't been launched yet. Elon Musk is betting $10 billion that he's going to be able to solve these problems. And the reason why we're going to talk about it in telecom is the FCC has promised Musk a billion dollars if he can deliver the 100. Is it 100 over 20 or 120 over 20? It's 100 over 20. Uh, it's, it's 100, I believe, yeah. Yeah, it's 100 over 20. Uh, and at the moment, he's not. He may be able to, but that's one of the key questions when we think about how we connect everybody. 
Last piece, Stu, do you think the people in India and Brazil and Africa should have access to vaccines right now? Absolutely, David. I think it's a travesty that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the privileged uh, uh, developed countries and, and uh, I, I just got to say, it, the, the, you know, the white countries have uh, such an incredible advantage. And the black and brown folks uh, across the globe are at such a disadvantage. You, you hear about folks that are stockpiling uh, uh, vaccines and not distributing them. Uh, just saw a piece today about the multi-billion dollars that Pfizer and uh, Moderna, I think Moderna's gonna uh, make $18 billion this year on the vaccine. And yet they have not figured out how to get it to some of the most needy folks on the planet. And I mean, the, the death rates that we're hearing from India, I mean, they're staggering. Uh, 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 a million folks every three days getting infected, thousands and thousands upon folks dying every day. Uh, Brazil, the same thing. And, and Africa, which was slow to uh, actually get the infections uh, uh, rate up, but now they are barreling along at, at some pretty high rates as well. And, uh, you know, we, when I say we, the developed uh, U.S. and, and uh, uh, Europe and to some degree China and Japan have figured out the solutions. And yet they have not been deployed in any really substantial way in uh, these other uh, uh, black and brown uh, countries. And it's hard for me to look at that and not say that, you know, there's some racist component there. Um, um, I think it's, it's even worse black because black. we have all those Astra, AstraZeneca um, uh, shots, AstraZeneca vaccine just sitting there, not yeah. doing anything. Yeah, Millions crazy. Of people, so. and, but I'm bringing it into this show, which is about connecting people, because it turns out Ericsson, Nokia, Intel, Cisco, and Qualcomm put themselves in the middle of this debate on the wrong side. Right now, there's a big thing happening at the World Trade Organization. I think it's the World Trade Association. Yeah, WTO. Which, got, which, is a, which has always in the treaty provided that an emergency patents would be waived. I can't imagine a bigger emergency than one we have now. South Africa and Brazil and India and a slew of politicians. Most of the Democrats in Congress I hear have signed on to it and 13 senators and some of the Republicans as well think that we should let India and Brazil and so on make their own vaccines. And I saw a fairly substantial estimate that for 200 million, which is a lot, but not for the government of India, they can have vaccine, uh, a, a billion doses of vaccine. So I was horrified when I saw a reference to the people that I know, the top Washington lobbyists for all the manufacturers in telecom, signed on to a letter of Biden saying he should not approve the trips that we have, it would weaken patents. And I, where, where's that coming know. from? Where's that coming from, Dave? What 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 are what's the, the tech interest in, in protecting it's, that for the pharmaceuticals? I assume what's going on is that beside the fact that Nokia has a lot of patent stuff, and Nokia happens to be a patent Qualcomm's the biggest patent group out there, and Nokia is trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I assume that it's just something like the guy at the trade association wants to get some things favors from the very powerful lobbyists from pharma one day. So he did a favor and he signed them on there. But I am bloody well going to ask the CEO of Ericsson whether he thinks his vice president for policy should have approved TIA. She's on the board and they have another seat on the board and trade associations like TIA are not going to do something if their board members object. So I've asked her, did she object? So far, she hasn't answered my three emails, which is about what I expected. 
But I happen to have the connection there. And if it happens to, if the head of Ericsson, who was also disrespected by the head of TIA in another one, which we can, we can come to next week, is I want to get to Scott, thinks that he has to fire the head of that trade association for the incredible bad press that I'm going to do my darndest to make happen, I will not be upset that he loses the job that pays him $600,000 a year to do things like kill people in India. And there's no excuse in terms of protecting patents. Let me throw some economics uh, in there, although probably not the way you, you, not what you think I'm going to say. Um, you know, there, there is a, an easy solution to this problem right now. I mean, the US government could just buy the patents. And then they would, you would eliminate all of the discussion of preserving incentives and so on. And then they could buy those patents and make them available. Uh, and you know the amount of money that we'd be talking about compared to what we're spending right now, um, it would just would be minuscule. I mean, it'd be in the billions, but um, it would solve the problem right away, make the vaccines available for production anywhere by anyone. Um, but that has not been included in any of our pandemic assistance. And I think it's kind of unfortunate because we could avoid this whole debate. Yeah. We have put a billion dollars on the table to buy vaccines. Right. That and and that was good, yet. but that's different. Yeah. And that's not getting out to people. Uh, and nobody needs to hear my opinion on vaccines or Facebook and Trump because you have, you, you have your own opinion. Let me go to something where we actually have one of the real experts here. In D.C. right now, they are talking, Joe Biden is strongly supported, and Kamala Harris is supposed to be running the program, spending $100 billion to improve broadband in the United States. Sounds good. There's some people who don't have broadband. There's a lot of people who can't afford it. Seems like they want to do, and it's politically great. Even the Republicans are supporting half of it. Because those are raw people who are Republican voters. And they want to say, we brought you a great internet uh, in towns in Arkansas that are so small, none, another, none of us have ever heard of them. It turns out that most of that money is going to be wasted, in my opinion. But I have an informed opinion on this. And Scott has done the research. Where most of the money is going to be spent is not connecting the unconnected, the 5% of the population that can't get a decent connection today. And most of the money is not going to covering the course for people who can't afford it. The vast bulk of the money they're planning on spending is going to be to build fiber where people already can get cable modems. 90 to 95% of the country. And I got good sources for that data, including the broadband plan. Scott, I did, the, I, I did this part for Columbia, the report to the broadband plan that said there's five or 10% who have problems and we can talk about them, but 95% don't. That's a good solid number. And spending 50, $80 billion to overbuild cable, which is about to go to 900 downstream they already have. And within the next two years, it's already shipping. They're mostly going to start having 100 upstream. Seems to me like a terrible waste when there's, that's enough to put up housing for 300,000 families. That's why I care so much. And Scott, you did some research on what would happen if we got fiber from another provider where today we only have cable. Right. So let me back up just a little bit and note that- um, <clears throat> These are all my opinions. I don't know where the Scott agrees with me. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, I do basically. Um, but so let's you know, go back to, uh, you know, we've, been, we've been subsidizing broadband since um, explicitly since about 1996. Um, and then before then it was cross subsidies. Um, but we've always had a bias towards rural areas. 
Uh, the vast majority of money has gone to rural areas, not to low-income people. We've largely ignored them. Um, and that's, of course, because of Congress, right? They, they, the rural states have much more power. Um, and that the high-cost program, or as it's called now, Connect America Fund, has been largely untouchable. And we're seeing some of that in the same build-out uh, uh, um, efforts. I mean, we'll talk about the $50 plan later, which is targeted uh, at low-income people. And so at least they're thinking about that, and that's a good thing. Um, but the uh, the subsidies that you're talking about, again, those are built out uh, to, you know, it's going to be to rural areas. And for what you're saying, um, it's uh, it would be to areas that already have service. And they're turning would what would be a 4 million person problem into a 64 million person problem. They're actually, the latest I'm hearing, and I talked to some people you know who are in the loop on this, is they're willing to spend that money anywhere where there's no fiber. That's my apartment in Manhattan because Verizon hasn't fibered my building. And that's an awful lot of people in the Bronx. We can get a cable modem that's perfectly fine, but if we can't get two, they think the government should spend a heck of a lot of money. And everybody thinks it's going to these rural places where they can't get anything. That's, that's not true. The vast bulk of the money is going to be spent where you already can get a perfectly decent cable modem. Now, what happens? Are people going to get a better deal? Will the prices come all the way down? So let's, let's, let's talk about prices a little bit. <clears throat> so if they're I mean, competition is good. We've, we've wanted to promote facilities-based competition for a long time, that, and we, we should. Um, but uh, when we, we, there's a lot of talk about prices in the U.S., and we say prices are, are that people will say prices are too high, and there's these debates. But if we're talking about um, low income, high. well, that, that's right. That's, that's true. Um, and we can talk about that, too. But the, you know, what we're, if we're talking about adoption, we want to focus on low-income people. Um, and so then the question, so then the question first is how much does the price, uh, affect adoption and demand curve slope down. So it does affect it. Um, there's no question about that, but it's not the only thing. And we'll talk about that more later too, I hope, cause that's a really important question. But then when you have two providers, uh, they compete, but it does not seem like they compete much for the low end. And so you really don't see, uh, so when, when you compare places that have only cable or only fiber versus places that have cable and fiber you really don't see an effect on adoption. And that's, you know, maybe we would have 10 years ago when, when you know, they were competing for lots of new customers, but that's just not really the case anymore. Um, and there, there just isn't a lot of competition for customers at the low end. Uh, and I mean, I think we have to, we have to recognize that because we're doing this, um, it, it's not a, uh, it's, it's, it's not really a productivity, it's not an economic productivity argument, it's an equity argument for make, making sure that everybody has some, you know, some, some level of connection. Um, but so expecting competition to, to, to be able to get this last group of people, I think is just not realistic. Take a minute and talk about how you did the research. Because most of the research in this field is, to is total garbage and I can knock it out in five, in five minutes. But you were pretty careful here. It's right. still very hard because it's not that much data, but. That, that's right. And, there, um, and, and there's, there's a lot of uncertainty and error. So. So what I did was um, I took the data from the FCC, which is has uh, providers at the census block level. Now there's a lot of there's some controversy about that data. So let me just tell you what the problem with that data is right up front. No, you want me to go past that? No, no, no. just show them just show them how much work you put in. Okay, so, so that they can expect that you're not talking off the top of your head like a Susan Crawford might or Chris Lewis. Uh, or even Harold Feld, who's usually one of the best, oh, who happens Harold. to be hitting this wrong. <laughs> I was um, arguing with him on Twitter on it yesterday. Uh, so, right. So we have this data from the FCC, which, is, which gives you information on um, the number and types of providers in different areas, so the, the technologies that they use. And they provide this at the census block level, which is usually a population of a few thousand. Um, and so that gives you the providers, and we want to know adoption. The FCC does not collect that data. Um, the census does through the American Community Survey and, and also the current population survey. They make that data available only at the census tract level, and they've done that since 2017. You can go back further, but you have to make the geographic area bigger. And the bigger you make the geographic area, the more error there is in availability. Um, I mean, the, the measure of availability. But so the common uh, geographic area here is census tracts. 
So we aggregate up the census tracts uh, to see you know, availability, which, which tracts have only cable, only fiber, which have both cable and fiber. And then we can merge that with um, data from the census about who has broadband. And then because it's the census data, we also have demographics. So we have an overall number about who has broadband. And then we know things like, well, we also know who has mobile only, which is an important consideration. Um, we can look at broadband by income group. We can look at it by race. Uh, and so when, when you combine these two things together, uh, you can get some good insights. And, and I think, you know, often that's what, that's the piece that's, it's not like I'm such a genius. It's, you know, it, it, but you get insights from combining different data sets together and see, you know, to see what they can tell you. Um, and that's, you know, and that's where this comes from. And let me translate some of that <laughs> because I actually studied some of this a long time ago and know some of the, and know some of this data, but there's no way in two minutes, Scott can explain it all. What you're hearing is a Stanford PhD who's worked 20 years in this field, how he does careful work. Doesn't guarantee he's right, but it's good, solid, careful work. Now, does this matter? Let me throw a question at you. If the United States spent whatever amount of money and got fiber to 20 million, 50 million homes that only can get cable today. How much do you think the price would go down to the home? Because that's the benefit to the home. It's not going to be faster than cable. Cable's going to be fast enough. Is it going to be much cheaper? Well, it looks it looks like we don't see any. We, we if if we assume that um, low income people will respond to lower prices. It looks like we didn't get any effect at all um, from fiber entering cable or cable entering fiber. Um, you know, they'll compete. They'll compete for each other's customers. That might take the form of, of lower prices for the people who already have broadband, but it might be other things too. They might compete on bundles or speeds or all kinds of other things. There's no guarantee it'll be on prices. And from the evidence we see, it doesn't look like it, it will have any effect on things that will bring the people who are not currently connected into the network, which is what we really want to do. After the break, we're going to bring Stu in talking about how we connect the people who aren't connected. He's worked for 30 years in Harlem and the South Bronx, and we want to look at that problem too. It's not the same problem, but it's an important one. But let me give you why I'm sure you're not going to get, beside the fact that I've studied for 20 years too, and I know the data uh, on this why you're not going to get a big change in price. A friend of mine who was vice president of Time Warner, Time Warner had a little cable company, explained to me, this was years ago, that we no longer have to go meeting in the back room of airport motels in order to get together and fix prices where nobody's going to see us. We've gotten so good at signaling that we can go to Wall Street and talk about our strategy. And us, the cable guys, and the other guys on the telco side know exactly what we're saying to each other. And we've managed to agree on something that is a higher price, as close to the monopoly as we get. Wall Street calls that rational pricing. Now, Stu, after the break, let's talk about what's going to be available and how we can help the people who are, listen, who are listening to this radio station, many of whom hey. have much money. Sounds good. This is Community and Technology on WHCR 90.3, a Stewie Dave Burstein special guest, Scott Walston. We'll be right back after a quick musical break.
Okay, we're back. Community and technology. Stu Reed, Dave Bernstein, Scott Walston. I uh, just had a quick little break there with uh, John Coltrane, Giant Steps, back to uh, technology. Um, before the break, uh, we were talking about uh, subsidized broadband and competition. And, 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 and Dave, uh, 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 please unmute yourself. And, and you can start. Yeah, let me, let me take it for a minute because okay. it's time to introduce you. Okay. Many of you know that Stu has been working in the Bronx and in Harlem for 30 years bringing broadband to the community. I first met him 25 years ago when they were actually building one of the most advanced DSL systems on earth using VDSL when almost nobody else was in housing projects in the South Bronx. It's been a long time, problems aren't solved. Scott's an expert on a lot of things. Stu's an expert on this one, although Scott's done some work there too. So Stu, what will it take to get the people in the Bronx and Harlem and Northern New Jersey connected? Why don't they, there's fiber, to, there's, there's cable to all of them. The physical wire is there. What will it take to get them connected? And Scott's going to have some interesting data for us. But Stu, think, you know, you're the I, expert. I, yeah, I think there are two primary uh, points that we need to look at. One is pricing. The other is relevance. Uh, with so many uh, low-income folks, um, you know, they have been sold and they are so oversold, so many uh, products and services uh, by uh, major corporations that, you know, they're, 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 they're kind of uh, in, immune, if you will, or uh, kind of just blocking out so much of the messaging that you hear about uh, products. If they don't really see why they should have it, if they don't see a, a real utility to improving their lives, they're not going to spend money on it. Um, you know, we do a lot of work. Most of our work is in, in public housing here in New York City, which is a huge population, half a million folks, half of which are unemployed, median income at the poverty line, $25,000, and fully half of that population does not have broadband at home. Now, granted, part of the, 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 the uptick has been in mobile access, which uh, is a much higher, I don't have the actual numbers on that, but it's a much higher penetration number. But folks- Over 90%. Yeah, many folks just do not see the utility and the value of having internet at home. Now, with the pandemic that hit, you know, a year ago, I think a lot of families kind of got hit right between the eyes with the kids at home now, kids needing online access to do all of their work. I think maybe there was a, 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 a rise in the consciousness and understanding of why we might need it. But until that happened, you know, th there wasn't a lot of uh, relevance for poor working class folks. One of the things that we did, Dave, you know about this, is, is we work with residents to, de to develop applications that they said they needed, that used broadband, that helped promote adoption. We at the, uh, one of the resident leaders, this is going back over 10 years now, came to us and said, look, I'm having problems with, with uh, seniors being accosted in the lobby of my building. Can you put up some cameras? What we did is we put up some cameras and we made the images available live to the residents themselves. And uh, the, the resident leader uh, called it virtual tenant patrol, which we've adopted that name. And the slogan became, we are watching us, where all of a sudden now you have family members that are watching the lobbies and, you know, some of the folks that think they want, are bad guys and might want to harass people, if they know their mother, their auntie, their grandma is looking at what's going on, they're going to take that nonsense someplace else. And that's not speculation on my part, that has actually happened. Uh, another one of the applications that, again, residents came to us for 
uh, complaining about they had no way to get their messaging out, to get their voice out. So much of, well, I should say not so much, but all of what you hear about public housing in the media is negative. So what we did is with them is we created uh, local uh, community streaming radio stations based in public housing and run by, programmed by, produced by folks in public housing. And all of a sudden you had a lot of old ladies, well, now what, what how does this tablet work? How, how can I see this? How do I get on this? How do I share this with my kids? And so the, the issue of relevance is, is really big. And uh, the other piece, of course, is pricing. Um, uh, Scott, you talked about, you know, and Dave too, about, oh, are there two providers there? Does anything happen with the pricing? No, it does not go down. Here in, in New York City and in the New York region, um, the Verizon entered the market almost 10 years ago now and essentially overbuilt with cable, overbuilt uh, Cablevision, now Altis, and Time Warner, now Charter. And so in many parts of New York City and the surrounding suburbs, you have a choice uh, between uh, two uh, monopoly, or I should say duopoly providers. And you're right, Scott, I will see no reduction in price, none whatsoever. You've seen fancier services, uh, more speed, we're faster than this guy, we have this uh, bell and whistle, they don't, but you've seen no reduction in price and, and no effort whatsoever to go after that 200,000 uh, or so people living in public housing that don't have the 50 bucks and more a month to spend on, on broadband. So that, you know, a, a, an additional provider has had zero effect on adoption and zero effect on uh, pricing on the low end of the scale. And I've, I've been watching this market for, for, for quite a while. Dave? I want to bring Scott in here. But before I do, I want to remind people, next Wednesday, the feds will give you a $50 subsidy or will give your phone company a $50 subsidy. Take advantage of it. They're going to try to make the rules easy enough that people will qualify. Now, a lot of, frankly, the guy here who really knows this is Stu, not Scott because somebody who spent 25 years on the ground really knows more than somebody who's a first-rate econometrician and is looking at data tests. But there's a lot you can learn by looking at data, too. And Scott, you've looked at some of this stuff. What did you find when, with the data that you had? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, particularly um, given what, what Stu has said. So, uh, there, there is some evidence on this, um, and, and we know that when people answer surveys, they say that the two reasons they don't, the people who don't subscribe say the two reasons they don't are um, cost and relevance. Um, but it turns out that uh, when when given a, a very heavily discounted plan, not you don't get a whole lot of additional people signing up. And the FCC, that's not to say more people don't sign. Not you, you still get you do get more people signing up. I would not argue that demand curves don't slip down. Um, but uh, the FCC several years ago did these experiments um, that were really, really well done for the most part. And they, uh, they worked with different companies, wireless and wireline, to offer very uh, inexpensive plans as low as a few dollars a month. Um, and they wanted to test all kinds of things. You know, how did digital literacy programs help? Um, did it matter if there were data caps? Uh, could, could you estimate how sensitive people were to prices with different um, different plans? And the one thing that they found was that they only got about 10% of the signups that they expected. Um, and so people sort of saw that experiment as a failure, but but it's not. It, it's I mean, it showed us that there are a lot of things we don't understand. And it's particularly interesting, I think, I mean, Stu, I can ask you this question because you started off by saying that um, that that uh, people who live in 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 um, in public housing are used to being approached by companies to sell all kinds of things. I think is what you said. Mm -hmm. um, and so, would that do you think that's an explanation for why people wouldn't respond to um, low price offers from from a company? I think that is definitely in the mix, Scott. I mean, there is so much hype and marketing hoopla, and, and it's such an oxymoron. 
but there's so uh, so much of the marketing of I mean this goes across across industries. Uh, it's targeted to poor people. Poor people are are like the guinea pigs of, of for so many products, and and uh, you know maybe the 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 uh, more middle income and upper income folks are more discriminating. And I think there's a, there's a bias, an economic and maybe even a racial bias, thinking that the poor folks just don't know any better and we can sell them anything and they'll buy that. Well, poor folks are not stupid and they know that. They know that that's what the major companies are thinking. So yes, I think there's a huge resistance to, to buy whatever I'm, whatever I'm told to buy, whatever I'm, I'm offered, there's gotta be a gimmick. And, and so often, uh, you know, the big companies uh, want to tell poor people what they can afford. And that, that's so insulting. If, if you know, if, if you don't have any money, and I, I've been poor, so I, I've, been, I've been on that side of the equation. And for folks to tell you what you can afford and that this offer is something that you can afford, I mean, it, it's, it's a real insult. When you're trying to put food on the table, you're trying to pay your rent, you're trying to put your kids through school, you're trying to pay all your medicine, et cetera, for uh, some provider of any service to tell you, oh, you need this and it's cheap and you can afford it. The, the automatic reaction is no, I don't think so. Does so, that, does that opinion go, does also include sort of the idea of um, broadband subsidies? You know, I mean, because the better idea, which we're not gonna do, would just be say, okay, everybody gets an extra 50 bucks a month, do, it at the, do with it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You know what? Yeah, what what we have found, and I say we are. I've been working with my partner Doug Frazier and I, who Dave knows for several decades now, and what we've been doing for the last twenty years or so uh, is providing free internet access. Mm -hmm. And we find that when it's free, folks will sample it, folks will try it out, and again, if you have applications and things on there that they can use it for. That makes all the difference in the world. Just saying, here's his internet. You know, it's like, so what? You know, why do why do I need them? I'm I'm living my I'm fine just as I am. So you 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 got to give it to them, and you got to give them a reason to use it. And I think that makes a, a tremendous difference. And and I think they're gonna have a hard time with that subsidy because it's a big educational hurdle to get folks to. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do know that some of the big providers have been making very concerted marketing efforts to resident leaders in public housing, trying to get them to sell the service for them. You know, I, I think there's been a lot of pushback because the resident leaders know better than that. Uh, but uh, I think they're going to have a hard time making any real impact with that, with that program. Let me ask you another Let question, if, if I could, right. um, th ah. which is about, um, sorry, this is great, I, about, which is about digital literacy uh, classes. Um, and that was another thing in these experiments. People didn't like them. In, in fact, in one, one, in one instance, people were willing to pay an extra $10 a month to not take those classes. Wow. And my sense is mm -hmm. that, there, I mean, first of all, there's no evaluation of these programs. We don't know whether it worked. And my sense is that people plan these these programs without any sense of what um, what the recipients would actually need. And they don't understand that the value of a poor person's time is extremely high. Um, I, I don't know if that's, that sounds right or not to you, but it's always been my sense that they're just not thinking about this right. Yes. I mean, the people doing the programs is not thinking about it. Yeah, right. it, it does sound right, Scott. And, uh, you know, one of the big issues is just a whole paternalistic attitude mm -hmm. of, of major corporations and of government. We know what you need. You know, we got all the answers. Here they are. And there is a, a kind of a built-in pushback from, from poor folks, especially black and brown folks, who have been lied to and used for, you know, ever, ever since we got here, uh, that we just don't have any trust in these institutions and these corporations. And- uh, I'm really glad we have Scott here because he knows an awful lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I could listen to him for a long time, and I have over the years. But there's one other thing I want to get to where Scott has a lot of expertise and we don't have that much time. The question is, what is the right subsidy? What is the right price for the FCC to pay for the program 
that is going to have the subsidy, which is great that we got it, and maybe it's worth paying three times what they should in order to get it through Congress, which may have been what was going on there. I don't, I actually don't know. But how would an economist look at it and figure out what should the price be if we had a competitive market, if we wanted a company to make a reasonable profit, uh, if we had an auction perhaps? How, how would you approach that problem? Yeah, so yeah, um, if, you were Paul, if you were Paul Milgram, who does auction theory, who you happen to have studied with, uh, or George Stigler, who my aunt happened to work with, who does microeconomics, nice. how, how, how would you go about figuring it? Because I'm going to, I, I want this answer for the people in Washington who don't understand. So, um, you know, I think it depends in part on what it is that you want to subsidize um, or what, what you're trying to do. If you're trying to get build out, um, then, you know, a reverse well, we have build out already. Right, so then, you know, then reverse because auctions are the way to go and except you can, you can mess those up too, as we may have seen. Um, so when you're talking about uh, money to, uh, to people, I, you, I think you do want vouchers of some sort so that people get to choose, not the companies, right? Um, and then before we get to what is the right number, uh, I think we're also missing a piece of the debate, which is that uh, what you what you want to do is make sure that the that the ISPs can't don't, can't simply take whatever the number is and decide okay that's going to be the cheapest plan, because like with the fifty dollars subsidy, why would they offer a ten dollar plan, right? Because for the for the household, it's still zero dollars, um, and there are you know and and to, so. For whatever number you choose, whether it's 50, whether it's 20, you want to figure out a way to build it, to design it, um, to prevent the ISP from being able to do that. And I don't think that means rules because those are you know, saying you have to offer this plan because those are you can game those so easily and so many things change. It has to be done in a way, so ideally, and, and of course now this, this will be a good time for your ivory tower comment because I'm not quite sure how to do this in practice. Um, but you, you want to do it in a way that the ISP does not know that the person um, buying the service is using a voucher, right? So, because if you can't identify who's using a voucher, then you can't price discriminate. Um, and in this case, it would be bad price discrimination, right? Um, and so doing that in practice is can be hard. Um, and so I'm not exactly sure how, um, but if the ISP doesn't know that you're using a voucher instead of your own money, then, you know, then we're, then we're in pretty good shape, at least in terms of those low, low price uh, programs, low cost programs staying around. Now, in terms of how much is the right amount. So um, again, it, it depends, I guess, what you want to include, what you think should be subsidized because um, people- it, it, I, I'll give, I, I'm going to make it simple. Okay. Let's say we decided that everybody should have 50 meg down, 10 meg up. That's enough for if you have five kids in the house to all be on Zoom for classrooms and it's enough to have three HD TVs. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So that, that, that's a reasonable minimum, I think. And that's a one that can be reached either by uh, wireless or wired. Right. So in terms of costs, you know, the actual cost of service, you've, you know those numbers better than anyone. So I'm not going to guess on those. But given what's in, what's in the market, um, my, my guess is, you know, 10 to $20 a month is probably, is probably the right number for the kind of thing you're talking about. And I'm, who's usually to the left on this, I'm saying it should probably be 15 to 25. Yeah, I mean, that's perfect. That we're reasonable. both starting with the fact that Comcast is selling 50 over six for $10 and making a profit by most, stand, by most ways you do account to it because networks are expensive to build. But once you build them, it's not very expensive to add somebody else. The number I use is it's between four and eight dollars to add a subscriber. And to my mind, if we gave the Comcast fifteen dollars, maybe even twenty-five dollars, I know they're going to make a profit. You see, the customers they wouldn't otherwise have, and I know it's getting a decent service. But I'm horrified at them putting $50 out there when they could have, when Comcast was selling it for $10 already. 
Now, that was Comcast knowing the same economics. That's why I know my economics are good. Because Comcast, Comcast is where I get some of those numbers. They can do it at $10 and not lose anything. Well, and, and also, I mean, that does tell us something about, um, about the effect of prices too, because at $10 a month and with a $9.25 lifeline service plan right now, you can basically get um, a home connection for almost nothing, as long as you're not using it for wireless. I mean, you throw that in and things get complicated, right? Um, but, uh, uh, but, but we know that there's still lots of people who haven't subscribed, even though the price is zero. And, um, and if we really want them online, that's, that's a puzzle. Well, and we're running out of time, but let me give you some quick things because we've all been thinking about this. First, Comcast has signed up several million people for that $10 mm -hmm. rate. That is proof to me that bringing down the price doesn't get everybody, but it does work reasonably well. David Cohn at Comcast told me it was essential to get out there and let people know about it and get it promoted and work with the schools. That also, and that's probably what the Fed, what the federal programs did wrong. I 100% agree with you. But as, as we sign up more people, the remaining people are harder and harder to get. And let me tell you the horrible thing that you actually said a few minutes ago. You were talking about digital literacy classes didn't work. They don't. They, they might be a great thing, That's right. but the evidence is overwhelming when you look at the actual programs, whether it be digital literacy or promotion of accessibility or any of the other programs, nobody knows how to write a government program that makes a difference except when the price comes down. And we had hundreds of these programs as part of the bird band stimulus with lots of different models. And I look pretty closely at that stuff. I believe that we should deal with gender inequality and racial inequality and all of those things are important. I don't believe that anybody in broadband and communications like this has come up with a way to do anything that works. So I think that's all wasted money. And Larry Strickling, who we all know, who had $5 billion of federal money, spent a few hundred million dollars on programs like that. And I didn't see any evidence that any of them made any difference. Well, Dave, let, let, me, let, let me just interrupt and disagree with you slightly. I would say that I would disagree with your statement that no one knows. I, think, I said government doesn't know. Okay, well, you're well, coming so, out of the community. I have you probably know. and the folks on the ground they know, and the problem is they are left out of the the decision making. But when you have the folks right. on the ground, the actual recipients deciding what's going to happen, and and Scott, just FYI, we have started to to put together community networks that are operated by the nonprofit resident associations. And as that happens, as they become owners and operators of the technology, as you train local folks in the community to put these in and maintain them, you have a paradigm shift. And, and, and to me, to, to my mind, that, that's what needs to happen. Uh, but we're about out of time. Well, I, right. Dave, I want well, to make sure you didn't talk about the $15 a month requirement that's coming down from Governor Cuomo for New York. That's State. next week, because okay, we're out of time. I just wanted to throw it out there for our listeners who may be listening, the governor just declared, and I'm not sure when it took effect or if it has taken effect. It doesn't take effect, it's gonna be tied up in court I, for I know a it's year. being uh, litigated, that uh, all yeah. the major uh, internet providers have to provide a $15 a month service for low income folks. And that's a great thing. And Scott, thank you for coming. You're obviously always welcome. You were sending me notes about the other things you wanted to talk about. And I didn't give you time because I wanted to get to these things. I so really appreciate you having me on. I, all the time I got, I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Thank you so much. It's fascinating. Well, yeah, thank okay. you. And I hope you can come back, Scott. I'd love to. Thanks, Steve. Okay, thank you. Uh, this has been Community Technology. Our guest was Scott Walston. Dave had the final note, Dave. <laughs> Scott Walston. What's the name of your thing? Technology Policy Institute? That's, that's the name. Technology Policy Institute. In Washington, 
He's an economist who's been doing this for 20 years, and he's one of the people all of us learn from. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Scott. This has been Community and Technology on WHCR 90.3 FM. Tune in next week, 5 o'clock, 90.3 FM. Thanks for checking us out. Good night. Thanks so much. That was really fun. Okay, thank you. Bye.